engineer or a mechanical engineer? I, I am actually uh, a chemist by by education, but uh, I had uh, a degree in electronics engineering when I was in the Air Force. I was in uh, electronics technology when I was in the Air Force. And when I got out, I stayed in the field and have been in the automotive manufacturing business since the early 90s. So by trade, I have picked up the electrical engineering and the mechanical engineering and, of course, uh, surround myself with really smart people that can design the ideas that I come up with. And in 2014, we designed uh, the nation's first all-electric, on-highway electric pickup truck from the ground up as a truck. So it's doing quite well, and hopefully uh, we go into full production in the spring. Wow. Well, now, Brooks, let me ask you this. I mean, I know I'm an old buzzard, but the idea of these self-driving vehicles is something I don't feel really comfortable with, but they're talking about self-driving trucks. Well, I can, you know, sometimes we use robots in the plant. Some of the plants we have are 50 or 60 acres under roof. And um, we have a section of the plant we call um recon which is recontainerization stuff comes in from the train or comes in on a a shipping container and we have to sequence that put it in in order of color and then send it to the assembly line and some of the sometimes we use robots or we use self-driving carts to drive those things to the assembly line but they're driving a wire that's in the concrete so they can't get lost well Uh, that i could remove you but i'm talking about actually on the highway yeah, the first the first self driving car I came in contact with uh, was a Lotus that was built by Lotus Engineering up in Ann Arbor, Michigan. They had won a, a self driving car contest. They only spent a hundred thousand dollars on the car, and of course, any car can can navigate a map, you know, by GPS. But then it has to take in other things like other vehicles around it, dogs, people, you know, uh, a tire tread laying in the road. It has to be able to see hazards, and this is where um, this is where the vehicles fall short because they don't have eyes like we have eyes. Um, for instance, um, or late last year, there was a car that smashed into the back of a tractor trailer's trailer because it was shiny aluminum, and uh, the reason is that the vision system in the car could not see the shiny aluminum. It was invisible to it, so it just drove into the back of the truck at 80 miles an hour. Of course, killed the people in the vehicle. Terrible. Um, And then they have a lot of low-speed mistakes. uh, There's countless YouTubes out there of drivers being run over by their own cars uh, because they make low-speed mistakes. They don't have uh, resolution like we have resolution. We can see, you know, down to a quarter of an inch, even at 30 miles an hour. But even a 3,000-bit camera cannot see that. So uh, it's self-driving cars are not there because the public is demanding them. Let's get that out right now. They are there because DARPA is pouring billions of dollars into developing the technology. So car company developers will come up with the navigation software that they can put into military vehicles for urban assault. That's why they're coming up with self-driving cars, because there's a lot of money in it, a lot of grant money. Nobody's buying them, and nobody ever will buy them. Nobody will ever buy them. This is all driven by military research. Oh, good. I'm glad they won't. I don't want to be running around with little robot cars running into me, right? <laughs> good Lord. Yeah, no, that yes, doesn't I mean, sound like fun. <laughs> No, and a lot, I see what you're saying. You'd have to react to skids on icy roads or what, all this other stuff. I just don't see it happening. But uh... Humans have 120 degrees of peripheral vision, and we can run as fast as 25 miles an hour at an oblique angle to that moving object and catch it midair in the glove. No robot can do that. So, in other words, we're not to be purchasing <laughs> any 
many self-driving cars right now. Well, if first of all, I don't think you long. can buy one. I think you can lease them. I think there are study programs, research programs, but I don't think you can actually buy a self-driving well, car right now. Well, the Teslas are doing mm-hmm. some somewhat of a self-drive. That's because there's but, a lot of grant money in it, and they need yeah. it. Because yeah, and I was supply there's something about there's a, there's a something lot of about them that. here in Chicago. A lot of those Teslas, I see them, uh-huh. are interesting. Well, now, what about that Uber? Weren't they having an Uber self-driving car? The, they have a that. self-driving module on the car, yes. But uh, you know, cars are are drive by wire anyway. You don't you don't press uh, a gas pedal anymore. We haven't pressed a gas pedal in over thirty years. It's a transducer that we move with the accelerator pedal that tells the computer how fast you're telling the vehicle to go. Um, so now the computer can do all that for you. But if it messes up or it's hacked somehow, then people die. And it's it's very dangerous. Driving a 4,000-pound vehicle at 80 miles an hour is dangerous anyway. But it's especially dangerous when it's in the hands of a computer. <laughs> Sounds wow. great. <laughs> well, I knew you were the one to know about all that. That's just despicable. <laughs> that sounds that cool. is. I am one of the very few people that know all about it, yes. So I'm telling yeah. you right now, you will never see self-driving cars on the highway in America. You might see them in urban where they're driving routes. They're driving the same route every single day. But there are emissivity problems with vision systems. There are glitches in GPS systems. I don't think there's a single listener to tonight's program that hasn't had a glitch in their GPS system on their phone. Well, the same thing happens in a car. Only when it happens in a car, somebody gets hurt. Wow. I'm glad you gave us that information. I mean, I I was thinking about these 80,000-pound trucks was being self-driving. I was thinking, boy, that's a disaster looking to happen i mean my goodness it is it is definitely a disaster waiting to happen that's a lot of kinetic energy and when you don't have a human behind the wheel or a human that's aware and awake of what's going on behind the wheel or in full control behind the wheel you have a real problem i'm glad you told us that i really am heidi what do you did you have a tough time getting back down from uh, milwaukee to chicago (laughs) oh gosh that, what what on earth hit us? I don't even understand it. Yeah, it was it was a bit wicked, you know. And and we have this thing called lake effect snow, so it was truly uh, just when you thought it was clearing up, it would dump some more on you. So I waited it out a couple of days in addition. So well, now how many, no work for me. How many feet? feet? Oh no, it was uh, you know, where I was at in Milwaukee, it had done ten and a half inches, and oh, they were expecting nothing. about four more. No, so it was that's over a nothing. foot. Over a foot. That was Albany pretty. got about two and a half foot. Oh, God. It's goodness. the wind that makes it so dangerous. Oh, yeah. Well, see, I, I'm just in love with New York, so I'm always interested in New York upping, having the one up in the ship on Illinois or any other place. I just love New York. <laughs> but no, no, they're getting lot. Some places, 40 inches. Some parts of upstate New York. But anyway. So I guess about so. those aliens at the pole, yes, <laughs> I'm yes. so dying to know. I've been hearing a lot of rumors about this going on. I mean, what are they talking about exactly? What is this rumor? Well, I wish I knew more because my uh, area of focus for the last uh, seven or eight years with the Inner Earth Expedition has been the Arctic, not the Antarctic. But I am fascinated with the number of people that have shown interest in the Antarctic lately, and I don't mean tourists, I mean like secretaries of state, uh, ministers uh, from Russia, uh, the fact that uh, there has been an early and accelerated evacuation that took place recently and a replacement with the military personnel. Something is out of the ordinary in the Antarctic, that's for sure. So you mean mean? when they're showing interest, they're going there? I'm sorry. Yes, yes. Secretary of State John Kerry went there. Um, One of the uh, cardinals from Russia went there. And, yeah, they took their pictures with the penguins, but that's not why they go. You can see those at the local zoo. Um, And it's, you know, there are rumors that it has something to do with um, uh, ancient uh, beings like giants that may have gotten out of their containment 
uh, perhaps, um, you know, a, a revolt by uh, another race that might be down there, military technology that was discovered that is not from around here, those kinds of things. Uh, but like you said, it's all rumor, it's all speculation, and there are lots of individuals that make a living on that kind of um, that kind of information. I'm not one of them, but yeah. they're all uh, tooting their horn like they know exactly what it is. Now, I've tried several times to go to Antarctica, but if you're not affiliated, that is to say not aligned with a university or a some kind of military grant program or with the National Science Foundation or Polar Research Foundation, you're not going to Antarctica. There's no tourist runs to Antarctica. And uh, so I'm not affiliated. I'm not associated with the military in any way. So uh, there were no openings for us. Anywhere else? Yeah. I'm I'm open to go. I didn't know there oh, was no. a, a rule against that area. Wild. Well, I guess you can go to the Arctic itself just anytime you so desire, I suppose. <clears throat> well, uh, there that's not a great tourist place either. I mean, there's no gas stations. No. Uh, there's only a couple of ways to get there. You can drive around the outside of it by sea, even though they're about the roughest oceans on the planet. You can go by dog sled a certain distance up from uh, Alaska or from Canada, but you're not going to go very far because, you know, the ice can be quite treacherous and you're not the uh, largest animal up there. And some of them can run 40 miles an hour over that open ice. Oh, you um, mean polar bears? Yeah, polar bears and, and sea lions too. They're, uh, they're pretty vicious too. They are really uh, I've, I've never heard much about them. And you can fly over it, but uh, we tried to charter a jet some years ago uh, to take 11 of us. And we were going to just take pictures out the window, but the lowest that it would fly was 17,000 feet. And they couldn't guarantee that we wouldn't just see clouds on the charter day. So sure. we, we said that's not worth it. Even Buzz Aldrin went down there, which is quite a rigorous trip for an old guy like that. Um, I just, it's just amazing to me, you know, Bill Clinton, Prince Harry, John Kerry, all these individuals going to Antarctica, it's like, hey, you guys better see it before it's gone, or hey, we discovered something really new we don't want anyone else to know about except you important people. Is the alleged reason that, that they're worried about the evaporate, the sea ice uh, uh, disintegrating or something like that, is that the alleged posted reason or uh well there is a large crack that's forming down there but you're right that is sea ice and it's not going to do anything except float around and uh, i think maybe even japan talked about latching on to it and pushing it to japan and using it for a source of fresh water oh, uh, it's not, it won't do anything you know to the ecology at all but if you have land ice that melts that that can actually affect sea level because if it's supported by land, it's not it's not buoyant in the water. Then you're adding fresh water back to the to the sea. You could you know add a piece of ice the size of the state of Connecticut back to the ocean. It could be significant if it's land ice. But if it's sea ice, it doesn't make any difference. Oh, Heidi, have you ever heard? Have you ever heard of? Uh, Brooks, Heidi, have you ever heard of the Purus Reyes map? I'm, I'm probably not saying it right, but yeah, the, it's 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 the really it's an it's an ancient map, and some are saying that it is a map of Antarctica without all the ice. That there's some kind of continent there, and um, I I doubt that that map is actually accurate because. If they actually did have the actual land shape down there, they would not have sailed the way that they said that they sailed. Oceans would be quite different. Because I remember that that was supposedly, and whatever I read some 15 years ago, that was uh, uh, ostensibly an accurate representation of the place without ice. I mean, that was what they were saying. Well, some of the ice cores... Uh, research that I've read, some of that ice is 25,000 years old. So I doubt it was an accurate map. Yeah, it doesn't sound like it. Well, I mean, I don't know how they determined it was accurate. I mean, some kind of imaging or something. I don't know. But uh, 
the, 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 anyway, the show I saw, whether it was valid or not, said that it was supposedly an accurate representation. I don't know how they would have determined that, but uh, that's uh, wild. Yeah, I'm looking it up right now. That's it, it is kind of cool. You know what I'm I'm curious about. You, you're mentioning all these dignitaries and and whatnot that have gone to the area. What I mean. How do we know that they actually went there? I mean, do we know exactly what area they're going to? We don't know exactly what area they're going to, but uh, uh, several of them have published videos, and I've actually watched the videos, so you can see, you know, John Kerry in his, you know, freshly bought Gander Mountain boots, and yeah. you know, all all the regular <laughs> stuff. You know, you could, but and they're there during the summertime. Um, which is our winter time, uh, you know, November, December, January. Um, but you know, now we're coming up on Antarctica winter. So we're talking about four, maybe five months of darkness temperatures between 60 and 90 below zero. Uh, that that's not the kind of weather that you fly planes in and out of because that's not so much now. Well, you need to be able to see the ice that you're landing on. And when it's pitch black, no moon, or overcast and dark, you can't see the ice. And it's it's treacherous to land and take off. So they, they like to go down there and back when it's light, when they can see. Makes yeah. sense. Now, it, it, there's also the rumor that uh, they're going there to examine the remains of a secret Nazi UFO base. Oh, yeah. What do you yeah. think of that? I, I think that's probably uh, valid because we do know that there are several dozen U-boats unaccounted for. Now, some of them, they figure were scuttled in the Atlantic somewhere and, you know, they took their uh, dinghies and rode into New York and assimilated that, that we know. Mm -hmm. But we also know some of the U-boats did actually turn up missing and um, they left out of Norway we tracked them that far, and some of them were carrying gold. Some of them were carrying, you know, high-level officers and leadership. Uh, and we do know that they were making trips down there as early as late 1939. So that's like five years of trips back and forth between wow. Germany and the Third Reich and Antarctica. That's a long time, and of course they had unlimited resources all the gold in the world, all the money in the world. They were the first ones out of the Depression. They had engineers out the wazoo, and they could have built quite the complex way out of the way in Antarctica, uh, so much so that, you know, Operation uh, Paperclip or High Jump was sent down there to yeah. survey the situation. And honestly, we don't have any official report of what happened. There are rumors that they met you know, flying saucers, that they were cut to pieces, that they lost ships and men, and they, they ended up hobbling their way back to Argentina and, you know, going home from there. And these are supposedly 5,000 battle-hardened troops because we just came through the worst war the world had ever known. And uh, they didn't want to go through it again, so they wanted to go mop up the rest of the Nazis. But officially, officially, there's no report about Operation High Jump. Officially. Or, <laughs> well, there is about everything else. That's really striking itself. I mean, everything else has been scrutinized to the maximum. Uh, but now, you would have thought there would have been reporters on the boat filming, you know, everything in, in black and white, at least. But there was nothing. No well, there were these folk nothing. tales. There were these little folk tales that at the end of the war they escaped down there. To, but I mean, what a terrible place to escape to! I mean, it must. I mean, a lot well, of that's what I would say. You know, anywhere above that ice is just going to be. I mean, the to, to get down to about six percent humidity, the human body just does not exist. I don't care how warm it is. Well, yes, that would be just ridiculous. But I mean, the idea of making an, an outpost or. Uh, you know, remnant of the Third Reich down there, you might as well just commit suicide right then and just not bother. Well, we but, did it uh, in the Arctic and around the same time period, too. We built bases up in the Arctic, and what we did is hob them out of the ice. And I've seen uh, great hour-long documentaries about the bases that we made in the Arctic. And, 
yeah, it was all under the ice. They were like big old huge Quonset huts built under the ice. <laughs> and they survived just fine. They had plenty of supplies, plenty of food, plenty of water. They had great entertainment, great food. Oh. And uh, they, it, you know, but at the end of the war, it was, it was abandoned. It was allowed to crumble. But you could do the same thing in the Antarctic quite easily. Yeah. I don't know. And there's also tremendous Russian <laughs> activity or interest in the Arctic. Antarctic. Yes, there is. And in fact, the Russians were involved for, I'm going to say, 10 years drilling a hole to an underground lake called Lake Vostok. Oh, and actually, yes. there are 90 countries that participate in an international effort to explore the Antarctic. And there are several science projects down there, not the least of which is measuring uh, neutrinos. It's a great neutrino lab down there. They have a lot of um, observatories for looking at the southern hemisphere, which we really don't see very well from anywhere else on the planet. Sure. And um, this is all run by this multinational, uh, I want to say it, a consortium. And they actually trade off, I think, annually. Well, now, uh, Burks, out of the we're just about we're just about ready to our bottom of the hour break. Uh, so we'll be right back with it. We'll be right back. There's no <laughs> report on any of this. There's no, even if there is press down there, they're not allowed to send anything out. I've not seen any pictures, no oh, really? reports. I go to the Polar Research Foundation to just look up papers, and everything is redacted. Everything is in abstract really? form. There's there's nothing to see. Nothing to see here. Move along. It's really? it's for the amount of money that 99 countries are spending down there. Yeah. There is not a whole lot of information that's published. Oh, what do you what, think about this? Uh, I'm sorry. The, the, the oh, go ahead. Pyramid that they're saying is down there. Yeah, I've heard that too, that there's a pyramid underneath the ice and uh, they, they're trying to do some ground probing radar, but trust me, I'm one of the developers of ground probing radar. It doesn't oh, work through water. Mm, wow, <laughs> water. there's a conundrum. It doesn't function. Yeah. It'll work through solid rock, but once uh, you're over water, whether it's a lake or an ocean or snow, verboten, it doesn't work. Oh, 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 that's wild. Well, I, I just, you know, there's one guest we have periodically that's uh, Paul Eno. He has a, sh a show in Boston, and he also used to be in military intelligence. And there, remember, Heidi, there are all these, these little anomalous places, even in the United States, that he and a fellow were investigating uh, Brooks just in Pennsylvania, you know, regular old Pennsylvania. And essentially, he was told from those contracts, million, military intelligence, just mind your own business and don't don't push this too hard. An investigation, just basically shove off. <laughs> and uh, yes, we all, we know about ten percent of what's going on. In essence, I remember um, you remember uh, the HARP, right? The High Frequency Active Auroral yeah. Research Program. Well, uh, I was approached because uh, of a paper that I had written about using. Uh, ground probing radar uh, for oil and gas exploration. And I wrote a paper that this kind of technology could be used to look for subterranean water on Mars. Oh. And I get a phone call from a group out of Alaska. They're shooting a documentary called, called Holes in Heaven about HARP. Well, I didn't know HARP from a rock at that time. But uh, they came down, explained to me what the system was, and I said, who, who invented this? And they said, Dr. Bernard Eastland. So we got him on the phone. I spent an hour on the phone with him. And I said, so how much, you know, what frequencies are you, they're using? And they told me what frequency, the carrier frequency that they were using for the harp invention. It was in the two meter band. I said, hey, uh, you got to be careful with that frequency because there are harmonics that can do real damage. How much power are you putting behind this? I was using 30 watts. They were putting a billion watts behind it. A billion watts? A oh. billion watts. Oh. And I said, let me do some calculations and I'll get back with you. So the next day, I, I get him back on the phone. I said, look, I've done some calculations here. And you really have to be careful because if you focus that beam, you're going to create an ion path between the, uh, the ionosphere and ground. And 
it may, if you charge up the ionosphere with enough energy, it may discharge back down that ion path. And not only will it wipe the harp facility out, but the entire ionosphere will discharge until it does not have the potential to make the jump anymore. It could go for minutes. And if it does, it's every single time it pulses, and it could pulse 10 to 15, 16 times a second. It will take six inches of soil with it. Good Lord. So it would be like 50 Mount St. Helens volcanoes per minute going off as long as it ran. And uh, that was, those are my, it was about 2.8 megatons per pulse. It was quite devastating. I called it a solar tap. So we made the uh, documentary, which came out in 1997. And it was a huge seller. It's I go to conferences. I still see that video for sale out there. I had hair and everything. Mm-hmm. That'll be darn. Well, you know that uh, there's some. I mean, why? What do they say? Why they would be using a billion watts? Whatever scientific purpose that would be for. I mean, it was. Uh, there were seven aspects to this. It was uh, discovered to be an ionospheric heater. So you could push the ionosphere out into space some miles and create a kind of atmospheric parabolic dish. And then you could bounce signals off of that to do several things. One, you could communicate very precisely with submarines without um, surrounding areas picking up the signal. You could you could do it very, very precisely. So you would, in essence, control the Marconi effect. You know, Marconi is the guy that bounced an AM signal across the Atlantic to a receiver. And he did so by using the ionosphere as a reflector. Well, you can't always do that because it doesn't always cooperate. It moves around on its own. But you can manipulate it. The second thing that happens is when you push the ionosphere out into space, the stratosphere moves in to fill in the void which can reroute the jet stream, which means you can move the atmospheric river around and somewhat control weather. So that was... Hmm. Yeah, so that was one of the... In fact, it was so uh, effective that that year, you know, Clinton was president and uh, Secretary of State James Cohen was Secretary of Defense, that we had to sign a global treaty and I have a copy of the treaty with his signature on it, agreeing not to use it uh, as a weapon, as a weather weapon. So That's crazy. (laughs) You know, this kind of technology is out there. You don't hear about it much in the last couple of years, but they were all big into talking about weather uh, weapons here within recent years and how... uh, Well, that's because uh, climate change was the number one enemy of the world. And, you know, if you have an enemy, why, you're going to go to the arsenal and pull your weapons out and go fight it. So here we are in this chaotic battle against Mother Nature using chemtrails and harp and everything else. And uh, and we lost. (laughs) It it, it didn't work. Oh, I got to tell you guys. uh, how do you, did I tell you about the chemtrails I saw over here, right in Dallas, Fort Worth? No, I, I I didn't hear about that. Well, Brooks, I'm only like uh, not very far, perhaps ten miles from the DFW airport, and I've observed. It's kind of on the Fort Worth side, but I've observed, honest to goodness, twenty four karat chemtrails around here. I mean, I took photos of it, had it on the phone for a long time, and I mean. I mean, obvious patterns made by some kind of jets. I mean, uh, it wasn't just the regular jet just going about its business. They were like little checkerboard square looking things where you'd have to go to an effort to make a pattern. And, you know, I'm not a pilot. I'm not, you know, Air Force guy or anything else, but I'm not an idiot. I mean, I, mean, I know there has to be some reason you're making a pattern in the sky. Well, there's and, another uh, hurricane coming this away, too, just so you know, because uh, Trump just released his taxes. Hold on. Oh, no. no, those, <laughs> yeah. those are, sorry to say, those are those tax reforms. Tax forms are 10 years old. Yes, Rachel, are, 2005. <laughs> yeah, Ra- Rachel Maddow is just trying to make some ratings for herself. And yeah, by the so way, she could still the find White House herself released in jail. It, though. 
the White House released it ahead of her. They just released it oh, just now. Awesome. Awesome. I love it. Yeah. Well, well I mean, 2005. Kind of water, over, water over the dam <laughs> taxes. But, but no, I mean, I was going to ask you about weather manipulation, that chemtrail business. Because like I say, I've observed it several times here. And it's obviously making little crisscross patterns, which is kind of expensive for a jet. Yeah, well, you can tell when they're there and when they're not there. We haven't had them this year. It's we've had our Carolina blue skies back, and you know the little three-inch contrails behind the jets that we're used to seeing. But I have seen them before. And one thing a lot of people don't know is there are jetways, skyways in the sky, because jets in the United States have to fly what are called airways. We have to fly nav aids from one airport to another airport. You can't just fly to you know, L.A. from here. No, 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 no. you got to fly to this airport, that airport, another airport. It's kind of a zigzag pattern across the country because the controllers at each one of the airports have to account for all the airplanes in the sky over the United States. Right. Even though planes are capable of flying by GPS, they're not allowed to fly by GPS over the United States. So there are skyways. Different altitudes, of course, for different directions, but there are skyways. So to see a crisscross pattern, like a like a bingo uh, yeah. or a, or a tic tac toe pattern in the sky, that That's is not what natural. Works. This is what, not what, what you would see with skyways. What would you say about oh, uh, airplanes that could be remotely controlled? Well, those are not allowed to fly over the continental United States. Even drones have altitude limits that they can fly, even military ones in the United States. Oh. And so they, even they're not allowed, but this technology no, exists though, right? It does exist. And in in the United States, you cannot fly a revenue point to point without an aircraft with an N number on it. And military aircraft do not have N numbers. So they are not allowed to fly revenue legs inside the United States. So what what do they use this for? This remote control type of stuff Most for of airplanes it's for rescue. For instance, if you if the cabin depressurizes and the crew passes out because they don't get their oxygen mask or they freeze to death at sixty below up there, they can take control of the plane and land it. That's what it's for. And that's only for in military planes, you're saying? Some commercial planes have them. They're not required by the FAA yet. And that's why occasionally you do see a private Learjet that flies off course and just keeps right on flying until it runs out of fuel and smashes into the ground because everybody on board is dead. Huh. Oh, that's interesting. So I've, always been, I've always been fascinated with the Arctic like yourself whenever I, when I've read the uh, little pieces out of Admiral Byrd's uh, account of uh, what going into the center of the earth and seeing UFOs and Lord knows what all. Uh, I've always been fascinated with the Arctic itself as, as opposed to the Antarctic. Because Byrd said he saw <laughs> UFO. Well, of course, being a North Pole inner earth expedition aficionado like I am and having led the expedition for seven years, I'm familiar with the story. Um, but I have to say there are two diaries. One diary was released by his grandson, and that is an official diary of the actual flight. In that diary, you'll see a couple of erasures and, you know, some notes in the side. It's all handwritten, some sextant readings, but there isn't any of what you just talked about. There's another diary that has a picture of like Agartha on the front of it. And that diary is fake from front oh. to back. Oh. Everything in it is phony. Oh, that's too bad. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it is too bad. It is too bad. Because, you know, the whole world was watching that like a giant reality show in its day. <laughs> and it was well publicized because it just, People just needed a hero in those days. This is 1926, so we just come through the war to end all wars. Uh, we were coming up on the Depression. It hadn't even happened yet. And people were really excited about being in high-tech times. And they took the uh, Chantier, which is a, a trawler of sorts, 
They took the uh, Fokker plane apart, took the wings off and put it on the boat, sailed it up to Spitsbergen, took it off the boat, reassembled it, and which took a while. And I have pictures of all this and then took off and flew at a, a blazing 80 miles an hour. 1,500 miles up to the North Pole and back. And according to his speed and his sextant readings, he was actually a little bit short of the North Pole. He uh, later changed some of the sextant readings in the book. And this is where the controversy came in about the whole thing. Because the only two pieces of equipment they had for navigation was the compass in the plane and a sextant. But it was a 1926 naval sextant, not capable of measuring down to the arc second. So he could not have put those measurements in the book. The sextant won't read out in those, those amounts. Not many people know that, but if you do enough research, you can find this stuff out. So there's some controversy about his North Pole flight. Uh, but nevertheless, he did receive the... Uh, Congressional Medal of Honor, and it was a big, big deal in its day. Wow. Yeah. Hey, I've got a couple of questions from the chat room. Um, oh, okay. This one is asking from Carol, was there any uh, information resolution to the mysterious object buried under the ice in Lake Blostick? Going back Blostock. about eight years ago. Sorry, go. Blostock. There you go. Art Bell addressed it, she says. There was... Um, some drone measurements that were taken by air and evidently under the ice along one of the shorelines of this lake which is about it's a pretty long lake underneath the ice they did pick up what they call an energy anomaly and it took a long time to drill a hole to this space they have to drill with alcohol because it's so cold you, you, you can't just drill the ice. You have to melt the ice, too. And the only uh, solvent that they could use in that area that would be allowed to be environmentally safe was alcohol. So it took a long time. Like, they only drilled three months out of the year. So they have to come back, chisel the ice off, you know, set everything back up again and start drilling again. It took wow. 10 years to drill this hole, a six-inch hole. Once they drill into, they're getting close to drilling into the area, now there are all kinds of environmental concerns. What if the headspace is under pressure? What if uh, there's a virus down there that we don't oh, have an yes. immunity okay. to? All of these questions came out. So they had to build a special airlock in the, in the hole, and then they had to go down with a camera, with a light source. And... Uh, Kevin Smith, the late Kevin Smith and myself, followed this very, very closely for a couple of years. And no real information came back out. No water samples, no life samples, no photographs. No, we weren't able to put a probe down there because the hole was too far and too long and too crooked. And it was just, it was a, a real, you know, problem. Oh. But evidently, it, recently, they must have discovered something. Because it has been very, very popular in the last six months. Wow. And that was kind of a follow-up to the other question. Somebody was asking about what the magnetic anomaly is in, uh, over there, too. So that's, uh, that's it crazy. Be, it could be a lot of stuff. I mean, it could just be a fissure in the ground, which, yeah. uh, you know, I've done a lot of scanning of property using gamma and uh, alpha decay equipment and and, of course, lots and lots of different kinds of antennas over nine states. And I have seen magnetic anomalies in the ground that were, that were repeatable. But, but, you know, other than just being a crack in the ground, nothing special about them. But, but evidently, this was putting off some kind of radiation. So we don't really know yet. I, as far as I know, the jury is still out. Yeah. It sounds mystery. like a, we, should, we should resort to the good old days of, Tie a rope around somebody's ankle and lower them <laughs> down slowly. And have them holler back what's going on. Well, I think it's about 2,500 <laughs> feet of ice, so. Yeah. You, 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 Kevin uh, will do yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> somebody really brave. skinny. Oh, I don't I'm know then. Never mind. I'm not that skinny. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> wow. I, the, the poles are just always 
it tickled me. But, you know, uh, that's actually kind of disappointing that Admiral Byrd didn't see any UFOs. I'm really sorry that there was a phony uh, account. Yeah. There have been oh, pilots no. that have seen UFOs. Uh, oh, yeah, plenty. I mean, but I mean, Bird himself, because he had credibility as being a big hero type and all that. So, but I guess we'll have to be satisfied with Buzz Aldrin and some others and Edgar Mitchell. That, <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. What was, which was the, which astronaut was it that was over at the pole? Um, that Buzz Aldrin. Had the, it was him, and he had that medical emergency. What was he doing over there? That we don't know. We, he had some kind of, uh, I don't know if it was, uh, it couldn't have been a heart attack, not at that age. But, uh, it, it, you know, he had some kind of thing. He had to be medevaced out, and it's not right. an easy thing to schedule. You know, if you have routes, you have schedules, but it's difficult to charter something to fly down there. It has to be specially outfitted. Yeah, I thought it was odd that they, you know, highlighted he needed to rush out, but they never said what he's doing over there. I'm like, huh? What is this? They never what saw I, what, what John Kerry was doing or the Prince oh. Edward or any of the other people that went down there. Why would, why would Russian uh, clergymen go down there? That doesn't make sense either. I mean, I, well, I saw the video with him, too, and it looked to me like he was a tourist. But <laughs> they didn't show anything other than him playing around with the penguins on the edge of the water. <laughs> Maybe they were asking Buzz, is this what the alien looked like that you ran into? It's <laughs> <laughs> like a long way to go to be a tourist and for a cleric type, but this doesn't seem to match up. But it definitely. Not, no, it doesn't seem to match up. It's not on the way to anywhere. No, no. Well, that, it, that's it's just intriguing. But but now let me ask you this. Uh, when is X squared radio on? Uh, how would I get up? Well, we are on at uh, 8 to 11 on Sunday nights. So... About 13 years ago, I was on Coast to Coast for the first time, and uh, somebody said, hey, you need to get a program of your own, and, you know, podcasts were rare back then. Uh, so I went on Sunday nights, and I built a following, and uh, I've been there ever since. I've just, uh, I've been, I started out at BBS Radio, I was there for 10 years, and then I moved over to Truth Frequency Radio Network, where... My audience is a little bit more uh, more prevalent, and we've been there ever since. And then the idea was Coast to Coast is on every weekday night, so I'm not going to compete with them. So I'll go on on the weekend. Yeah. And uh, over the years, it became the first news show of the week. Instead of wrapping up the week, I was the one driving the nail in the headlines Sunday night. Well, that's and, good. I'm, check, I'm checking out your site right now. Uh, you look so normal. Well, you know, I'm thinking of an Einstein looking crazy guy. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> well, I have to operate in the real world. I have a day job. Uh, being a CEO of an electric car company, they expect you to, you know, if they're going to invest money in you, they want you to look normal. I guess. Oh, wow. uh, if I was Kevin's an out. oh, Katie, bar the door, I'm never cutting my eyebrows again. <laughs> wow, Kevin, you could never make it. I look pretty normal. <laughs> Just like kidding. A, like a red-headed gorilla, but I mean, <laughs> like something, you know. But, but I had an anomaly that, you know, this is fairly interesting. It wouldn't really match up too much with your expertise, but we're talking about in the car issues, uh, well, what happened was my business partner and I were driving a little rental because we're doing all this running around the last couple of weeks, and I heard a mechanized voice say, wait, wait. And I was just at a suburban intersection. It wasn't, uh, you know, anything, you know, frantic kind of uh, avoidance maneuver. And the crosswalk? Uh, it, uh, no, it was just a regular old uh, non-protected intersection that was, you know, just uh, very anomalous. I mean, nothing. I mean, very pedestrian, rather. And anyway, what I'm saying is uh, it sounded like it was in the car, not saying a loudspeaker from another vehicle. And I've never run across that anyway with somebody wise guying you with a microphone or anything. But we both heard it audibly. And I talked to a 20-year tech at the Toyota place. And they said, there's, there's nothing like that. I mean, you know, if you have. You know, navigation, you might say, take left, take a ne next left in 100 feet or something like this, something very specific, but not preachy like that. At any rate, it, we sure enough both heard it, and nobody has an adequate explanation. None. 
That's bizarre. So I don't know if you right. It is bizarre. Oh, well, the only <laughs> thing I can think of is sometimes crosswalks have those, you know, crossing aids for the blind. You know, like no, this wasn't. This doesn't have anything that specific. It's just a regular suburban neighborhood. I mean, nothing. It wasn't a, a marked off crosswalk or anything like that. No, it was. That's just, amazing. So, did <laughs> did it help you avoid some? I don't accident I or like did a train go by in front of you or no it was like I say it just seemed very pedestrian nothing pedestrian in the context of normal I mean nothing nothing impending impending doom now maybe if I hadn't been alerted to waiting maybe I'd have been struck by somebody took a quick left or something but it, there was no way to that made any sense to explain it none. but uh that, there you I have all kinds of weird, I have weird things happen all the time, but, <laughs> but that's what your mission. Your mission's not done. I, I, I was curious about what you thought about uh, the Morgellons, Mor Morgellons disease, where those fibers are growing out of people's skin and they're blaming it on the chemtrails. Well, do you see any link with such a thing? I don't have an opinion on it. I, I I've seen it. It fascinates me, but I haven't studied yeah. it. I I don't have anything to say about that. I mean, that is a a really weird disease to have oh, and, yeah. and very irritating. <laughs> well, I bet. Well, I mean, I've, is, I've had that after great. hanging fiberglass, but, uh, Oh yeah. Right. <laughs> Painful. Well, now Brooks, it's been great having you. We're just about ready to have to say, uh, good night, yeah. but it, it's very excellent. I hope it's not so long before you're back on again. Uh, just really? say the word, just oh, say the word. I'd love to join you anytime. Wonderful. Oh, it was, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much. Well, you have fun in North Carolina, and I'll stay here in the uh, <laughs> Texas. And, uh, I'll dodge uh, bullets I, in I Chicago. I worked down there in Fort Worth. I like that area. <laughs> uh, it's, it's not that bad. Not <laughs> but, uh, will you take care, and we'll keep in touch. We sure will. Truly, yes. Thank you very much. Have a great, take, great time. Take care. Thank you. Well, Heidi, we're just about ready to come to our uh, top of the hour break. When we come back, we'll have uh, George Haas on and William Saunders. We're going to talk about men on our faces on Mars and anomalies, and people smoking cigarettes and behind boulders and just <laughs> anything else that goes on up there. But we're speaking to a lot of people that are interested in this kind of thing, and we kind of just put a group together. And then uh, after we got some images back, uh, William Saunders came on board. Oh, okay. Well, you know, I've always been intrigued with Mars too, and uh, there's, well, I mean, I've seen alleged pictures of everything from tennis shoes to, you know, uh, golf carts or whatever, and you don't know what's true and what's not. And, uh, but I mean, isn't it true though, George, that way back in antiquity and the, as soon as they had telescopes, they, they've always observed a lot of activity, even on the moon, you know, like unusual lights. And, is that true with Mars as well? Or is that just baloney or something um, like they read it? Well, yeah, they they observed a lot of uh, interesting uh, lights flashing uh, off and on 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 the moon. Uh, I don't think there's been any uh, evidence of any lights going off on Mars. Uh, oh. But of course, you know, we had the canals on Mars, and uh, when actually we went up there with the the Mariner nine uh, spacecraft, we were able to get some higher resolution pictures of the surface. Of course, there were a lot of uh, um, faults and things in the, the surface that could have been these uh, canals that uh, were observed. But uh, what uh, the most uh, astonishing thing was found besides these, uh, you know, crevices and canal-like features were all of these uh, pyramidal formations that they were seeing. Oh, yes. I forgot about those. Yeah, sure enough. Even uh, Carl Sagan had uh, noticed some of these uh, formations. So that really got the whole idea of, uh, you know, past civilizations on Mars, uh, you know, rejuvenated with that type of uh, uh, imagery that we were getting back. Well, how far is, have they done it? I guess they have over all these years, but the Martian atmosphere, does it have any, any level of oxygen that's even close to supporting life as we know it, or uh, they tested the components I think of it? 95% carbon dioxide, but uh, oh, okay. it, it uh, probably did have, um, there's there's evidence that it did have more of an atmosphere and probably a lot more oxygen at one time. Oh, there's I'm just not news, sure how long ago. All right, there's a news report uh, currently on the internet about uh, 
this study that shows that um, you know Mars was very Earth-like, had a lot of water. I mean, there's more and more evidence coming out that uh, you know at one time Mars was probably very Earth-like, and oh. uh, probably sustained uh, some type of uh, you know plant life, uh, possibly higher life. And uh, from what we're seeing on Mars, there was obviously evidence that there was a civilization there. So uh, but the more we learn about Mars, the more we see that it's uh, very Earth-like. And, uh, you know, the things that Bill and, Bill and I have found on Mars uh, seem to mirror what we have on Earth here, uh, seem to have been also uh, prevalent on Mars. Well, uh, I know... Uh... Of course, the face on Mars, of course, that's intriguing. And from the pictures I've seen, you know, I'm not by any means an expert in any way, but what I've seen over the years, I don't see that that just is just a happenstance circumstance. I mean, in other words, it does look like a carving as opposed to just a peculiar rock formation. What's the all's yeah, well, take on You know, um, NASA was the first. Uh, you know, their scientists were the first ones to say that it looked like a face. It wasn't, uh, you know, Richard Hoagland. It was actually uh, the NASA scientist. Uh, yeah. When they went through the files and found the, 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 there's like three really good images of that formation from the uh, the Viking image. Uh, you know, even NASA thought that it looked like a face. So, oh, okay. uh, you know, right from the beginning, um, you know, NASA was the one that uh, found this. It wasn't, uh, you know, the, the public. Right. But, uh, you know, we've gone from the face uh, through all types of different formations found on Mars with the uh, Mars Global Surveyor images, the Mars Re Reconnaissance uh, Orbiter that's up there now taking these high-resolution images, uh, yeah. which, you know, there's just overwhelming evidence that there's uh, artificial structures up there. And uh, what we're talking about tonight uh, on your program will be a, a science paper that we just had published in the Journal of uh, uh, Space Exploration, which is a, a trade science incorporated uh, publication that comes out of England. And uh, we had this published back in November. And we think this, I mean, put the, the face on Mars aside, because it's very controversial about what type of uh, formation we're looking at here. But this okay. keyhole structure is just your basic geometrics. It's it's a symmetrical, geometric form, and it's very easily to understand, and it looks like something that is not natural. Okay. So it looks like a keyhole, you say? Or, uh, well, we just... only call it a keyhole because that's what archaeologists call these kind of formations. I mean, they're oh, okay. uh, keyhole formations where American Indians built them. Uh, they're out in, they're in Saudi Arabia. Uh, they're also in uh, Japan. Japan... Uh, which most people don't even realize that uh, before the, the contemporary Japanese uh, took over the island, there was an indigenous people there that built these, these, um, these keyhole formations. Uh, which oh, before the Japanese? To the Japanese, but they're, they're just all over the place. And, you know, oh. they don't get a lot of attention until we find one on Mars. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Well, I didn't know there was a previous race in Japan to the... To forerunners to the group. Oh, yeah. When, when the Japanese came down, I'm, I'm think. I mean, I'm not an a anthropologist, yeah. uh, but, you know, the Japanese, very similar to the Chinese, the uh, North Koreans, South Koreans. Uh, right. But uh, you can just Google this. Uh, the, the, when the Japanese inhabited the island, there was a indigenous people that were there. Okay. They were a lot taller. Oh. They, they so were, when you say a keyhole, it just looks like a keyhole in a door, I guess. Yeah, that, the whole... that's Basically, just they're they're calling it a keyhole because of the the geometry of the formation. Right. It looks uh, like a, NASA, a giant exclamation mark. Well, right. Well, NASA, um, if you go to the um, the uh, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter website, and you you put, I mean, we have if if the listening audience wants to go to the Sedoni Institute, uh, just type in the Sedoni Institute and you can go to our website and. Uh, click on the link that goes to our discussion board, and we have a topic here, which we're talking about tonight, about the keyhole formation. But actually, when we first put this topic up, it was called the exclamation mark, because that's what NASA called it. Um, they said this looked like an exclamation mark. But, you know, archaeologically, it's more of a keyhole formation. Okay. 
and uh, they actually had a um, a geologist come in, and uh, his name was Alfred McEwen. Uh, he works for NASA, and he actually did a whole uh, dissertation on the, on the website about what this looked like. There's a little caption there. They're trying to explain away uh, the geometry of this. And even the, the NASA scientists that they invited on to put the caption up for this, this uh, image, uh, they can't explain it. Uh, it's, it's just so unique and so uh, symmetrical that even NASA can't explain how this was formed naturally. And you can talk to uh, William Saunders here, who uh, you know, has a background in geology, and even yeah. he had trouble explaining how this, this thing was formed. So there's no way that erosion or what have you would, would make that kind of a, a structure. Any thoughts well, the there? The thing is that it's, it's yeah, fire? it's um, it's uh, very isolated. You have two large pieces of rock uh, side by side, or one above the other, depending on how you look at it, that are geometrically opposed. One is uh, round and uh, rounded on top and almost circular. And the other is angular, and um, it's a, a trapezoid shape. And um, they're, they're miles and miles away from anything else their size. So they're sitting isolated, and um, there is symmetry to it, um, geometrical symmetry and opposition built right into it. I'm taking a look at your site. It's pretty uh, pretty interesting. A lot of cool images, a lot of interesting uh, chat and discussion going on. Well, you've got a lot of information on your site. <laughs> it does sound pretty good. It really does. Sony Institute discussion board? Yes, I, I looked yeah. over there. I'm going to share it in the chat room so people can check it out as well. Yeah, if it, the listeners out there, they go over to the Sedonia Institute, just click on the discussion board, and when you get on the discussion board, uh, go on to the uh, the topic, the thread for the exclamation mark, and it will give a link to our paper, and there's a lot of images on there. We also have um, one of the diagrams that, that uh, if you go, if you scroll down to like half down the page, uh, we have a, a, the geometry that's explained uh, with, a, with a drawing showing that all of these uh, angular lines that are in this formation, I mean, it's just exquisite. The, the, the yeah. geometry in this formation. And, and some people that are listening, it's the C Y D O N I A Institute.com. So they don't use well, an S. Sidonia, <laughs> Sidonia, yeah. People are used to saying Sedona, and I'm one well, of those it, people. This is so. all related to like <laughs> Sedona, Arizona. Mm -hmm. uh, the Sidonia area on Mars was named after the master builders of the Bible that built Solomon's temple where the Sidonians. Uh -huh. If you look in your Bible, the Sidonians, it's spelled S-Y, or S-I, the Sidonians. Mm, okay. Basically the same thing. They were the master builders. And NASA just happens to call the area where the face on Mars is Sidonia, which is a reference to the master builders. And, of course, there's a lot of structures in the Sidonia area with the D&M pyramid, the face on Mars, and the city area that Richard Hoogland talks about. And not only is uh, all of these structures on Mars in the Sidonia area, they're all over the planet. Oh, yeah. Interesting. So, it, I've heard a, 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 something that looks very much like a spacecraft on the surface. I, it, what do you make of some of these, like, uh, not, you know, the things that were not attached necessarily to the planet, but, but like evidence of, of visitors going to the planet, like a ship? Uh, what do you think about those types of things? I mean, I've heard a lot of different claims. And I, yeah, I, I've seen those images of ships yeah. and saucers and things. And yeah. they, they, they just look like natural domes or, or natural formations. Oh. Or, or possibly, um, if they're not natural, they might be artificial structures. But I, I don't think they're remnants of spaceships myself. Oh. Uh, do, do you run into... Course, that's, that's very sensationalized and gets a lot of headlines. And, and, yeah, and was, and you know, it's just like... Do you get a lot of opposition when you say, oh, well, mine are real, but yours aren't? I mean, you know, <laughs> because I hear that from ghost hunters who don't believe in UFOs and vice versa, like, oh, those nut jobs. You know, how, how, do, you, uh, how do you defend against, uh, you know, naysayers who are even kind of on your side but saying, no, that one's not real, this one is? Well, what Bill and I have found over, you know, we've been doing this for, you know, 20, over 25 years, and it's, 
some research, if I put in quotation marks here, research or find some blurry picture of a formation that looks like uh, a structure or something, it, it'll get uh, massive uh, coverage on Google and on the Internet. And, you know, Huffington Post and CNN will have stories about it. And 99% of the time, these are all just natural formations or blurry images. Uh, we have received hardly any coverage of this keyhole formation that, that, you know, we've actually had a science paper published. And, uh, you know, CNN, Fox News, uh, ABC, NBC, Washington Times. Well, not, Washington. The George Automated Road, we're, we're well, none of them are interested. We're, we're just coming to our last break. Uh, we'll, we'll be right back. It's a very brief break. We'll be right back. Well, what are some of the others besides the keyhole uh, formation? Well, um, Bill and I are also members of the Society for Planetary SETI Research. Uh, mm. You familiar with uh, that group? I've heard of them. Yeah, she has well, a... the group was started by uh, um, actually uh, a group that Richard Hoagman put together uh, when they were waiting for NASA to take new images of the face on Mars. It included Dr. Brandenburg, Dr. Mark Corrado, uh, Dr. Stanley McDaniel, Dr. Horace Crater, all, all these luminaries of this kind of research. And uh, they put together after they split with Richard Hoagland uh, on a lot of controversy that they had over the uh, how he had approached the media with the face on Mars discovery. Uh, yeah. Stanley McDaniel and uh, Mark Corrado and uh, Dr. Brandenburg, they uh, put together a group uh, that they called the Society for Planetary Study Research. And they have about 50 members. And uh, as a group, over the last, uh, well, I'd say, 30 years, they produced probably 30, 40 papers on uh, anomalous formations on the, on the surface of Mars, which, uh, you know, gets no media attention. I mean, people think that, you know, well, what's going on on Mars? Uh, you know, there's no science done about anything that's been, uh, you know, it's all geology. But there's always yeah. these other papers that are being uh, published in science journals that deal with anomalous formations on the surface of Mars that really gets uh, little attention. I, I really so. did not. I didn't get any good grades in geology. I'm going to just be honest. But um, <laughs> I always wanted to take it. I just never did. It was fascinating stuff, and it seems like it'd be easy. Nope. Uh-uh. Well, a lot of the members of the Society <laughs> for Planetary Study Research are physicists. Uh, they have a couple of uh, geologists. Um, but most of them are physicists, so uh, not many geologists. Mm. Oh. Hey, very cool. Uh, I was, I, you know, I'm, I'm really curious. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, there's so many different types of people out there in the world, and you know, it's like a lot, a lot of people that that are driven by into these different areas of of research. I mean, we have, you know, we're 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 aiming to try to forward or advance mankind and their understanding of this world or the universe. I, what is really behind you guys? What what drives you? What's your passion and what's your ultimate goal in uh, researching this topic? I mean, it, it's, it's mind blowing and it's a, it's a tough doozy. I think, I think, uh, you know, Bigfoot eating ghosts is easier to prove, you know, this is the toughest thing you guys could have taken on. I mean, what, <laughs> What's what's driving you? I'm really curious. I love it. Mr. Saunders? Oh, well, I guess it's just natural curiosity. Uh, uh, when I first saw the face on Mars from the Viking orbiter back in 1976, um, I I just knew that that had to have been artificially constructed, and that, that kind of set me off. And um, I don't know, I guess just growing up in the air of... Uh, space exploration, you know, going to the moon and Star Trek and Lost in Space oh, and yeah. those sorts of things just, uh, it kind of got me, got me interested in, um, I don't know, it just, it just kind of, whenever I saw any information, I looked into it. Well, you know, uh, what do you, oh. let me ask you this, uh, I'm interrupt, honey, but what, uh, how much of that footage do we get that's not, I mean, how, of the footage from the uh, rovers and all that. How much is, uh, say, redacted or uh, available? I mean, as a percentage, to the some it's censored. In other words, what I'm trying to say. Well, um, this is George. Um, oh, okay. Sorry. As far as I know, 
none of it has been redacted or um, screened. Uh, NASA, okay. If you go to the websites that actually uh, post all of the new images that the, the rovers take, the little you know vehicles that are driving around, uh, there, there are yeah. hundreds and hundreds that they put up a month uh, oh, of okay. the images, and um, they just take one picture after another. And there's you know one little area of Mars. There's like 20 pictures or, or oh. more. And, uh, you know, you have to go through. It's a laborious uh, task of going through these. But they just put them up. And I think NASA, um, they're not hiding anything. They're oh, putting okay. the information out there. But the main thing is they are not commenting. Yeah, they're not interpreting uh, it. Yeah. Anytime yeah. that any of the NASA scientists are doing a paper, uh, one, the, the main theme is to uh, discuss is there water on Mars? And if there was water on Mars, how long ago was the? It's all about water and the geology. That, that's basically what they focus on. Uh, if they see something in the landscape that looks like an old machinery or an old, uh, you know, the, the the chassis to a 1957 Chevy, they don't even look at that because that's not oh, geology okay. to them. So you know, they want to push that out of the way because the, the rock behind it will tell them more about the planet than that chassis sitting there. And it's, it's bizarre that I'm sure you've looked at some of these images of the, the rovers that take these uh, landscape images and you look in the distance. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that rock over there, that looks kind of weird. But yeah. you know, we'll drive the rover over to a rock that looks like a rock and get a real close-up of that one. But the one on the left there that looks kind of like you know the chassis from the 57 Chevy, they won't even go near that. Or that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's it's kind of like censorship well, by omission. All we're left with is is this distant picture of something that looks like machinery. Yeah. And we never get any real close ups of them. So it's censorship by omission, right? Kind of thing. So well, listen, we I started to they're do taking close ups of them and that we don't see, but they do release a lot of images. And the images that they do release do have a lot of data that show that there's a lot of crap sitting around. It looks like there was a massive war. Things blew up. There's stuff all over the place. And it looks like a war. Genuine artifacts. Yeah, genuine artifacts. Yeah. Well, I, certainly, I certainly recommend everybody go to the Cydonia Institute and, and uh, investigate it and follow it. And uh, it's been great having you. Uh, yeah. It has. Really well, thanks very much. you on your show and getting the message out. Yeah, truly. Oh. I, I love you guys' uh, passion. It's great. Are we done already? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it's all yeah. It's, it's it's amazing how good times go quickly. But Happy listen, we'll, we'll send you copy. We'll send you a copy of the show, and uh, we look forward to keeping in touch with you. Yeah, well, definitely. Yeah, thank you very you much. Guys. It's a pleasure. Okay, we all Early. have a good evening. Y'all have a good evening. Yeah, good night to you guys. Good night. Now, Heidi, next week I may give you a week off. Uh oh, why? Well, Donna Voss is going to be on. Now, she's one of the nicer, uh, you know, conservative commentators. But, I mean, I know that you don't want to be afflicted with people that uh. have common sense. <laughs> so, I, 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 I think I recall Donna. I think she was halfway normal. Oh, you seem to get along well with her. But, I mean, I was going yeah. to be the opposite, you know. Oh, not, she's cool. I, hey, if I have a pulse, I'll be here. Well, now, now, who I would really like to have you on is my beloved uh, Megan <laughs> Kelly, but she's eh, she's hard to get. She's making so much money, you know. Yeah, and, Megan is sensible. She really is. So I oh, mean, she's not that fun. not that Goldie Hawn wannabe from the '60s. I don't no, know. Wait what that... a minute now. No, uh... no, no. <laughs> I, I love her, but anyway, that's a whole other story. But anyhow. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Okay, so I may Donna Voss is going to be on next week, and then uh, Karen Anderson is going to be on the following week. And we'll what have she's speaking on. Well, she has a new book on animal communication, and uh, oh, cool. And let's see. Oh, yes, and uh, Michael Brown from uh, SpiritDaily.com is going to be on uh, the week after that. So we've got a lot of big guests coming on. Love him. You know, this Friday I've got Joanna Summerscales from the ET Newsroom. Oh, yes. So it's Friday at 8 p.m. Yeah, so it's going to be interesting. She's from across the pond. So uh, interesting discussion. Yeah, I, I've uh, 
I, I don't know. There's there's so much uh, that's going on out there in the world. It's just kind of wackadoodle, and it doesn't have to do with Trump. So I'm putting my focus and attention that way because I want to get depressed. <laughs> well, you got to admit, that was a pretty cool weird bunch of weirdness about some dude wearing a bowler hat on CBS <laughs> News. I, oh, I mean, why doesn't, he just, why doesn't he just wear a, cl- a bozo of the clown outfit with polka <laughs> dots and had a funny nose or something. I, mean, I feel so are... out of touch. I haven't been watching the news for four days because I was stuck in Milwaukee, you know, hanging with family and friends. So I, I've been out of touch. So I, I'm out of touch. You should have seen the expression on the CBS News guys like, <laughs> and you know, they're thinking, what the heck is this? Who is this? Who is this guy made up for? You know, I mean, I mean, <laughs> hi, come on, that's something like, uh, you know, out of a comedy uh, skit or something. I mean, uh, pretty funny. Wish I saw it. <laughs> well, I mean, of all the things I've seen, this was about the weirdest. I mean, if, I mean, if 